My gateway into the world of studying Western esotericism was through alchemy. In fact, I even convinced my high school Latin teacher to let me translate parts of the 15th century alchemical text, the Aurora Consurgens, for my final exam for Latin II. And I still have my alchemy notebooks over there from when I was like 15 years old. I've been fascinated studying and now teaching about alchemy for lots of years now. And part of that interest has also shifted a good bit, somewhat away from the side of metallic alchemy, but how alchemy also shaped the development of medicine following the Paracelsian Revolution. And to better understand that intersection of alchemy, medicine, and early pharmacology, I've decided to, I've decided to recreate some alchemical spigerical medicine using actual 16th and 17th century alchemical texts and period accurate reproductions of alchemical equipment in this case a 17th century style glass alembic so come join me in my kitchen downstairs as i walk through getting into the mind of a 17th century alchemist developing what i think is a pretty accurate period appropriate formula and using the very kind of equipment a historical alchemist would have employed to create a spigerical cure for melancholy. And um, I'm going to give it a try and, and hope I don't get sick or die, God forbid. If you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah or the history of the occult, make sure to subscribe here to Esoterica and also check out my other numerous content on topics in esotericism, including some curated playlists. Also, if you want to support this work of me potentially poisoning myself or providing accessible and scholarly free information on topics in esotericism here on YouTube, I hope you consider supporting my work over at my Patreon with a one-time donation with the super thanks option you can see there below the video or by picking up some of the cool merch some of which is alchemical related over on the store tab but let's go recreate some alchemy i'm dr justin sledge and welcome to esoterica where we explore the arcane in history philosophy and religion So to recreate something like a period accurate alchemical medicine, we need to get into the mindset and the grind set of how an alchemical doctor of that time would have thought and how they would have worked. And to do that, we need to cover a little history, a little theory, and then turn to some historical sources before running our experiment on me. What I'm planning to prepare is an alchemical medicine or a spigeric preparation to use the very strange language that Paracelsus developed. So how did such a preparation work in the mind of an alchemist of the period? Again, we can't think of imposing our ideas of medicine on to them. Well, starting in the 14th century, an alchemist by the name of John Rupesitia, which I've done a whole episode about, and ultimately culminating in the theories and practice of the 16th century maverick Paracelsus, who I just mentioned, alchemists held that one could extract the quintessence, or the spiritus, of a substance through distillation. This quintessence, or the fifth element, because it had its origins in the superlunar world of perfection, it was the closest substance to the divine, in fact the angels were made of it, and thus it had the ability to balance out all the natural imbalances that exist down here in the world of the four elements, or kind of three elements for Paracelsus, but giving such an extraction, it had radical, curative, and even life-extended power. For John of Rupesitia, the fundamental quintessence, at least the one available most easiest to us, was extracted from pure wine that had been distilled seven times, what we then and now call aqua vitae, or the water of life, eau de vie, ishkiva, whiskey, etc. In fact, the term spirits for distilled alcohol goes directly back to this theory of the alchemical quintessence. But it would be Paracelsus, really, who would combine the herbal folk remedies of the cunning men and women of his day with the most advanced alchemical technology of his time. People, of course, 
especially women, had long known the value and the curative properties of various plants, herbs, and botanicals. What Paracelsus argued was that by macerating those botanicals in aqua vitae and subjecting that mixture, that macerate, to distillation, one could extract the various spiritual properties of those herbs, minerals, or other substances and actually greatly improve, in fact, greatly concentrate their curative or restorative properties. In a sense, Paracelsus argued for a combination of alchemical techniques traditionally reserved for minerals and for metallic substances, of course, obviously in the hopes of transmutation, that's to say transforming one metal into another, typically lead or something like that, into gold, but combining that technology with the herbal folk medicine largely rejected by academic doctors of that time, they preferred the Galenic theory of balancing out the humors through things like emetics and bloodletting. In this way, Paracelsus and his followers that would come after him in the centuries following his works basically invented modern pharmacology and paved the way in an important sense to all of modern medicine. And that's what we're going to be recreating today. It's going to be recreating the quintessence of several herbs as a typical 17th century Paracelsian spigeric medicine. So how exactly should we go about making a recipe for this? Well, to try to recreate something period appropriate, there's no better path forward than by looking back to the literature of the time period we're trying to recreate. So I've consulted my 1616 edition of Paracelsus's medical works in the original German. I've also checked that against my copy of the 1658 opera Omnia, his complete works in Latin. The Latin's often clearer than the German, but the German is more authentic. And this is a mammoth work. Paracelsus was the second most prolific 16th century German writer after Martin Luther. And combing through his works is frankly overwhelming. But some of the key herbs that he seems to prefer did jump out to me as a kind of foundation. But one also quickly realizes that many of these preparations also contain straight-up poisons, like mercury and antinomy. Now, I do have elemental mercury here. I have cinnabar right there. I have antinomy in the form of stibnite, stibnite crystals right there. And um, I am not including those because while I might be okay with experimenting a little bit on myself, that's not an experiment. If I put straight up cinnabar or stibnite into this, I'm going to poison myself. And so uh, just going to pass over those ingredients. Sorry, not sorry. But to get a sense of what kind of herbs would have been best in a preparation like this, I also consulted the most classic English herbal guide of that time. Nicholas's Cole Paper, 1652, his English physician, or later the Complete Herbal, in my edition of 1666. 1666. It's not a bad omen or foreshadowing or anything. Omen. But this text is a fantastic edition because it allows me a direct peek into how 16th and 17th century herbalists went about doing their work, especially in the form of things like specific astrological assignments of various kinds of plants. In this case, I'm going to key into some more Venusian botanicals to, you know, counteract any of those melancholic Saturnic tempers that might be lying around in some botanicals. I'm trying to cure melancholy, not induce it. Next, I'll be consulting Johannes Hartmann's, at that time, definitive and absolutely famous Practica Chimiatrica. This is in my edition from 1647, but it was first published in 1639. The praxis quickly became the definitive guide to Paracelsian medicine at that time, and this volume contains a host, hundreds of recipes, various treatments, and the specifics for the distillation of spigeric remedies, so I really can get into the head of the how-to of this. And again, lots of mercury and tenemy, so lots of no's on that. But the Praxis is the best. It is a fantastic textbook for this kind of Paracelsian medicine, and I'm very lucky to have access to it right here in my hands. Finally, for a little insight into how alchemists of the time thought about distillation, I also consulted the classic textbook on that topic, The Coilum Philosophorum by Philip Ulstab, which contains the combined wisdom of such alchemical titans as Arnold of the Villanova, Raymond Lull, both Pseudo, Albertus Magnus, and our boy, John of Repsitia. So that's the guy that invented this whole quintessence idea to begin with. And 
That text is fantastic because it covers all of them from the guise of how to think about distillation. This text is also great because it illustrates the type of equipment I'll need to use to reproduce this whole alchemical medicine properly. I want to use something like period appropriate technology. Interestingly enough, my 1658 copy was previously owned by none other than Madame Blavatsky, co-founder of Modern Theosophy. So here's to, I don't know, hoping I get a download from the Akashic Record in this whole process. All right. After consulting these period alchemical and herbal texts, the botanicals I decided to go with are Heather Tips, Rosemary, Mugwort, Yarrow, and Sweet Gale. Culpepper and other contemporary herbals all agree on the beneficent power of these herbs. In fact, my brewers out there, all my folks who like to brew, you'll recognize what I did when this list came together. These are all the kind of herbs actually used traditionally in the production of gruet. As you may know, before the implementation of the Reinheitsgebot, which restricted beer production to water, grains, hops, beer makers employed a wide variety of herbal and botanical infusions, both to flavor and to preserve their beers. Some of these herbs, especially yarrow, heather tips, and sweet gill, were known for amplifying the intoxicating effect of these beers, and we do now know that those herbs are very mildly narcotic. The herbals of the time actually noted this mildly intoxicating property and actually recommended these herbs as remedies against melancholy. So I'm apparently producing a 17th century alchemical antidepressant. Maybe I'll invent something great and I can sell it to Merck or something. And as many of you know, I'm a pretty experienced distiller and I've worked on several Lots of small stills, like little 20 liter stills and commercial rigs for the production of the absinthe that actually is coming out this autumn. So if you want to buy some esoteric absinthe, look for that this autumn. More news on that coming. So distilling herbal macerations is something I actually already know a little bit about. That's why I'm not including fennel or wormwood or, or anise in this because I've kind of already done that. But that's in a beverage producing capacity. And what I'm shooting for here is something much more along the lines of an early modern medical setting rather than a, you know, making liquor. So no big copper distilling equipment here and no big mashing or anything like that. Rather, I'm going to be using a reproduction glass alembic typical of the 17th and 16th centuries produced by the fine folks over at Historical Glassworks. You can check out the link in the description if you want to check out some of their amazing historical reproduction of glass. And as you can see from the antiquarian alchemical texts I've been looking at and other illustrations, their work is spot on. So much so that this alembic is actually produced with soda lime glass and not modern borosilicate, which actually makes it a little bit more dangerous to use because it's much more susceptible to thermal shock. Hence me pouring in some warm than hotter water before subjecting this alembic to any real heat. I don't want it to shatter and explode. So to start, I've gotten some very pure aqua vitae, surely at least as pure as anything John Rupacitia or Paracelsus could have recommended, and I've macerated these herbs for, I don't know, several days. In a nutshell, I've taken some medieval beer or gluet recipes indexed those to recipes found in Hartman and Paracelsus, and then adjusted those ratios for the macerate being subjected to distillation, basically increasing them by about an order of magnitude. And to test that I've gotten a solid extraction from the botanicals, I'll just take a small sample of it and add a bit of water. And that it quickly turns cloudy tells me that there are substantial amounts of essential oils now in suspension in the aqua vitae which will then be extracted in the distillation process, or the way to put it in sort of alchemy language, it's going to extract those quintessences. So I'll add about 0.75 liters to the cucurbit or the flask, along with about as much water. Again, this alembic is rather small, precisely because it's used to produce medical preparations and not something like spirits as a beverage. Now, this alembic cannot and should not be subjected to direct heat, that will certainly cause it to explode, so I'm going to be using a hot sand bath. Though I would suggest that in most cases a bain marie or a steam jacket would be even more ideal, but you work with what you have. The ambix, or the cap, is then placed atop, very carefully I might add, which basically operates as the condenser. For the folks out there who are, I don't know, a little bit at home or have some experience with distillation, you'll notice there is no actively cooled condenser or worm, and sources actually vary a great deal if the ambix in the cucurbit should be looted shut, typically made from 
paste from rye flour. So in this case, I'm not going to be looting it shut, mostly because I'm just frankly not that concerned with efficiency in this case. And removing the loot from this, from this very delicate glass is, well, it's dangerous and I really think it could break the ambix and so I'm just not going to deal with the rye flour. I should also say that the glass beak or the solen of this ambix is extremely delicate and just attaching the receiver or the fiale is kind of nerve-wracking. It feels like the, the, the beak is just going to snap off. But now the very slow process of heating up the maceration begins and like I said I'm doing my very best to avoid any thermal shock. After about half an hour, there's certainly some movement in the curcubit, and after about an hour later, we do have a very mild boil with vapor starting to condense in the ambix. I'm actually pretty surprised about how efficient just the passive cooling is from the size of the surface area and side of the ambix. In fact, this is something that Professor Principe was also surprised about when he began experimenting with just these kinds of distillation apparatus. Most of us who are used to some distillation are used to active water cooling through a condenser, but this setup actually works really well in the end. Again, more evidence that the alchemists of old really did know what they were doing. They were ingenious experimenters, and this is just another reason to respect the ancestors and their wisdom. But a little after an hour, distillate did begin to drip very slowly uh, through the beak or the solen, and drop by crystal clear drop, it began to fill the receiver and my kitchen with a distinctly aromatic herbal smell, a bit like a meadow in spring, which is funny because it's lots of snow here. I imagine this aroma is kind of, must have been a bit like what alchemically trained doctor's offices would have smelled like back in the day with drying herbs and highly aromatic botanical aroma, a bit like a dry gin, but much more floral. But the process here is very slow, and as you can imagine, temperature control is an absolute must. But several hours later, I had secured the lion's share of the heart of the distillate and decided to cut off the heat. Of course, the ambient heat held by the sand bath continued the distillation process for another half hour or so, and by then I had collected just about as much in the fiale as was rated for this alambic. And after a quick check with my hydrometer, which I apologize, I forgot to film that part, I tempered the distillate down to about 50%, uh, which is proved uh, to use sort of, I don't know, Western talk now about this, and proving it really opened up the bouquet in a dramatic way. The addition of the water also made it clear that a substantial amount of the herbal essential oils had made it across in the process, and thus the quintessence of our heather tips, rosemary, mugwort, yarrow, and sweet gale, all under a Venusian aspect, each known in their time for their mirth inducing and maybe a little bit delirium inducing and thus anti-saturnic powers. Now the aroma here is distinctly herbal. Indeed, it's pretty medicinal, which that's kind of what we should expect. It's a bit like mint though, with something a bit more of a pine aroma. It's astringent, certainly to a degree, but very, very clean while still being floral and light, delicate even. All right, so this is the part that I'm sure you've been waiting for. This is the distillate. It's obviously my medical jar now, as opposed to uh, that beautiful fiale, because I don't want to break that thing. But here's our yield, and let's give this a try. Things people do for YouTube. All right, I'll be using my uh, glass here that I got from the Icelandic Museum of sorcery and witchcraft, which has this great sigil on it, which hopefully will protect me. I'm going to call that enough. All right, so the nose, like, like I said, is astringent, a bit like pine, has a very almost hay-like flavor, um, but very botanical, very floral, a bit like gin, but I would say something uh, a bit more stringent than gin, not quite as thick. Um, but definitely in the glass, you can see the um, the essential oils are certainly in this uh, in this distillate. But um, it smells like medicine. So, all right.
strong. Um, the closest thing I could compare it to would be something like gin, but very stringent, very medicinal. It has a um, floral botanical quality, and the after it tastes is certainly like gin. Um, it, it, it tastes a bit, like I said, like a meadow. It, it has all these very delicate flavors dancing around in it. You certainly wouldn't drink this for pleasure, I don't think. It's not the kind of thing that you'd want to make cocktails out of, alchemical cocktails. But it does have a distinctly medicinal flavor. It, it does taste like the kind of thing that you would go to the doctor and get. Um, I don't know, the word potion comes to mind. It definitely has this sort of Dungeons and Dragons-y potion uh, flavor. It's clear. You could color it. Um, I've thought about uh, coloring it maybe with something like hibiscus or something to give it a red color and a little bit of hibiscus flavor, which I think would complement this well. Again, if it's medicine, hopefully it will go down easier. But what else is going on in it? I mean, it's, it's nothing like I've smelled before. It's certainly a very distinct aroma. Yeah, just very botanical, very floral. I mean, it's, 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 it's nice smelling, actually. All right, one more. Yeah, I mean, it, it tastes like it tastes like medicine. Um, like I said, a bit pine, kind of a aromatic pine flavor, and um, yeah, distinctly floral and herbal. I, again, I think this is what medicine tasted like 300 years ago. I think we've created something really really created something like an alchemical medicine from 300 years ago. I don't know when the last time anything like this was made, but um, here we are. All right, so from consulting historical sources and antiquarian editions, using my historically accurate alchemical equipment, and some of my knowledge from the brewing and distilling world, I think I've created or recreated something very similar to what would have been a alchemical or spigeric medicine typical of the mid-1600s. I mean, yeah, without the mercury and the antinomy, of course, but... Well, also, I'm, I'm lucky I don't really suffer from melancholy, uh, so I can't testify to the effects of this stuff. I mean, I'm not dead yet. I'm not rushing to the restroom. But if I do end up feeling something, whatever that means, I I'll let you know in the comments. I mean, if the lights start getting more interesting or something like that, I'll, I'll let you guys know. Hopefully... Nothing deleterious will happen. I'll let you know if that happens too, but for obvious reasons, I would not recommend trying this at home. Just at all. But a fun little experiment here at Esoterica, and I hope to do more recreations like this in the future, so stay tuned. All right, well, thank you for watching, and uh, I'll see you next time with more alchemy content. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, religion, and apparently medicine.